Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Paul Duncan McGarrity. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity, and this episode we have an absolutely stonking interview uh, with the uh, owner, operator, uh, and proprietor, controller, editor, uh, star of the Archaeoduck uh, YouTube channel, Dr. Chloe Duckworth. Um, she is a really interesting person who has been, uh, has done so many fascinating things with her career so far. And we just do a light touch on quite a lot of them because there's so much to try and fit in. Um, I, w- I won't talk too long about uh, that because obviously the interview will cover it all. Uh, but what I wanted to say is just a few things up at the top. Uh, number one, um, thank you for everyone who has listened to, uh, and watched the uh, Talking Walls video series that I put up. Um, and thank you for those that have given me feedback on it as well. It's been very useful indeed. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it is a short uh, four video series uh, that I put together on how you can do an archaeological Logical recording of your own home. Uh, there will be a link in the uh, description for this podcast if you are interested in uh, following along at home. Uh, it's a wonderful way of doing archaeology without having to do any invasive uh, excavations uh, that we uh, again touch on very briefly in the uh, discussion that uh, follows. Um, secondly, uh, this is uh, one of those things where you don't have to do it if you don't want to or if you can't, so don't worry about it. But um, if you ha- uh, would like to support the podcast and, and the upkeep of it, I've opened this thing called uh, Coffee, uh, which basically it's around the idea that if you uh, want to tip me, you can tip me the equivalent of a the price of a coffee. Uh, basically, you know, it would be the same as if uh, I'd come and done a lecture or a talk for you and you wanted to buy me a drink afterwards. Maybe not in London, but, you know, somewhere outside of London, if you wanted to buy me a drink, you'd be able to. And um, again, same thing. Uh, the link will be in the description below. Uh, it'd be much appreciated and it will just help cover, uh, you know, the, the minor costs of keeping this old creaking ship afloat and uh, finally I just wanted to say um, I hope you're all doing well I hope you and yours are happy and healthy and uh, as always if you wanted to get in touch with me about archaeology or indeed about anything uh, you can do so on, at Ask an Arc. Um it's usually the easiest way of getting in touch with me I'm happy to chat about absolutely anything It'd just be nice to hear from people um, but before that, uh, here is my interview with uh, the magnificent Dr. Chloe Duckworth. I hope you enjoy. Bye-bye. Talking to Archaeoduck, or more regularly known, Dr. Chloe Duckworth. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. I've just got a dog trying to climb on me while I'm answering your questions. I mean, but... if, if, if you wanted to do this interview <laughs> set on hard level, sure, why not? <laughs> I, uh, um, I've got a few things that I want to ask you. Um, I've mentioned that you are Archaeoduck. You, uh, you run the YouTube channel uh, of the same name. But... We'll get to that eventually, I think, because I think there's there's so much that I want to talk to you about, um, mostly about the sheer number of times that the word fire keeps appearing in various descriptions of your interests. <laughs> yeah, I really like fire. Um, and, and the best way, I think, to, to play with fire with, that, with, with keeping it legal <laughs> is, uh, is to do some experimental archaeology. Um, so yeah, I do. I do love fire. I, I, but that's because I study pyrotechnology. So I study glass making, ceramics, metals, and obviously, the thing that binds them all together is is this human control over and manipulation of fire. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, you, no one can see this because it's a podcast, but the look in your eye was simultaneously exciting and terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my students talk. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk fire. But really, let's find out a little bit about you first and how you got to do what you are uh, uh, doing. Um, so you work at the University of Newcastle, is that correct? Yeah, Newcastle University. Oh, yep. right, Newcastle University, not the University of Newcastle. Yeah, we differentiate ourselves from... There's a University of Newcastle in Australia, so we're Newcastle University. <laughs> right. That's good to know. Um, Sorry, it's not that important. but No, no, it feels like it is. That's that's what you do now, but what got you interested in archaeology in the first place? Well, that's going back quite a bit. I was, uh, I was 18, looking at degree choices, as you do, and I was thinking, oh, I'd like to make some money. So I applied to do law, um, and I got a place to do law at Durham, and... Um, and that was going to be what I did. And everybody looked at me and they were like, Chloe, that is not you. That's not you. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? And I just kind of, I chickened out and, and I thought, I can't do this. What am I doing? Why were you going to do it? What what made you choose that one? <sighs> I think I thought it was a sensible degree option. Ah. Uh, you know, good, solid degree option. Well, there was no parental pressure in this. Yeah. It does suggest that archaeology is the uh, less than sensible option. Well, it just, I think when you're, when you're 17 or 18, you don't actually know much about archaeology. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, law is kind of, it's something that you see a lot of on TV. It's yeah. something that you hear a lot about and your teachers are kind of pushing it on you. So I had no idea what an archaeology degree was. And I think I was just looking through handbooks. I was just looking at options and it just looked so cool because it combined all these different things. And I was interested in everything. I've always been interested in everything. So I, I hated having to narrow myself down science, arts, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah. Actually, archaeology just looked like, oh, you can pick and choose and use all these different skills. Um, and that's really cool because it's also studying the past, which I always loved history anyway. Right. Um, so, it was... And then I, yeah, I just got to university and realised that it was definitely for me and I loved it. <laughs> well, that's, that's good that it paid off. That would have been an awkward three years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could, yeah. <laughs> Looking over at the law students like, ugh. <laughs> there they go <laughs> so what, would, what did yeah. you actually study when you were when you were doing archaeology is because were you in kind of a, a general degree a sciencey heavy one it was a very general degree and um I didn't go into that with a with a particular science background and so I went in and just took a whole range of different courses just took what, what took my fancy this is at uh, University of Nottingham um and I I just started being really interested in all these courses that were looking at all these modules that were looking at science and how you could apply science to archaeology. And that's what made me want to do archaeological science. So I then did a master's. I did an MSc. And that was one tough year because I was catching myself up on quite a long time, you know, since I'd last done any science. Um, yeah. So it was pretty intense. Right, uh, but it it paid off. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's always the, it's always nice to know, uh, know the end of the story before. It's like, luckily, she was fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I always tell the master students now. Like, you know, th this is intense, guys, but it's well worth it, and it is. A master's is an amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. So, what kind of things were you looking at during that master's? Well, I did a master's in archaeological material science, mm. and it was half taught in the material science faculty. So it was actually um, people looking at things like polymers and nanomaterials and things. But obviously you had to know the basic, you had to have a basic understanding of all materials yeah. and how they're constructed and how they behave under different circumstances. And then the other half of it was looking at technology, the history of technology in archaeology. And so you bring, you bring those two together and, and you have kind of the right grounding, I think, to then do yeah. um, archaeological science on materials. Yeah. So I don't do organic stuff, just inorganics. Right, so that's for yeah. people that, uh, you know, it, that's kind of like uh, ceramics, um, stone, uh, anything like that? Yeah, that's right. So nothing that's once been alive, really, because um, mainly because the stuff that's been alive tends to, you know, it's a bit smelly and weird. So I'll, <laughs> stick, I'll stick with my nice inert glass and all of that. Well, this is it. We've, we've mentioned it a couple of times, but the glass seems to have really caught your imagination. What, it was, what was it about glass as a material? within the archaeological context that sort of sparked an interest? Well, we had, uh, at Nottingham, where I was an undergraduate, we had um, a, a professor, Julian Henderson, who lectured us on um, glass. He taught a whole module about glass. And I think for me, it was just that realisation that I've never thought about glass before. <laughs> like, it's never crossed my mind. I've spent my whole life surrounded by glass, drinking out of glasses, looking through glass windows, and I never really thought, 
you know, when was it first made? Why do we have this material? Actually, this is quite an extraordinary material. Yeah. Um, it's absurd that people were making it three and a half thousand years ago um, because it's insanely difficult to figure out how to make it and, and to even make it successfully. So I think that just caught my imagination that this is this, this is something that I'd never thought about before and I just wanted to know more. Yeah. And you, you've, you've managed to travel the world researching glass as well. It, it sounds like you've been to some really interesting sites, particularly the UNESCO ones that you've been working on in Spain. Yeah, um, this is, I mean, this was the absolute dream for me. I, in the last few years, was lucky enough to direct projects on two UNESCO World Heritage sites in Spain. Um, one of them wasn't a UNESCO site when we started. Um, and, then <laughs> and you're like, by the time amusing, we're done. Slightly amusing story around that. Well, exactly. So what happened was I, I got funding for it. And in my funding bid, I started the bid with the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Madina al Zahra because I believed that it was, um, because it was a candidate and I'd misunderstood the, the thing. So I actually got the funding and then realised I'd made this terrible mistake. <laughs> and I was so ashamed. I thought, I've, I've lied my way into this money. Um, but actually, then it became a, a World Heritage Site. So I thought, oh, well, there you go. It's OK now. <laughs> wow. That... Um, <laughs> That is a surprising yeah, the, sidestep. <laughs> Just like, whew, they've, oh, oh God, I'm, I'm so glad that's a world, world-renowned world site now. Goodness. Were you, did you have a hand in pushing it? You're like, go on, go on, it's pretty important. Come on, come on. Well, we, well we, without boasting, we sort of did because, um, because the stuff we were looking at, um, a lot of people had done work on that site looking at the very elite residences mm. and very few people were researching the rest of the site it's a city and it's got a palace but there's the rest of the city as well and so we were surveying it um so actually part of the reason the bid was given was to, due to all the different research that was going on at the site and that was one of one of the projects so it was nice in the end it came full circle yeah um but i honestly still to this day don't know how i ended up working at those two sites um and eternally grateful that i get to now publish the data from those yeah that's, you, you know, I haven't talked about what they are, have I? <laughs> well, we've got the idea that one of them is a city. <laughs> so, yeah, what are the two sites? Yeah, well, I mean, so one of them is the Alhambra in Granada, which is quite well known as a tourist site. And the other one is, I've mentioned, Med- Madinat al Sahra, which is near Cordoba. And they're both medieval sites. They're Islamic Spanish sites. So this is the period when southern Spain was ruled mm. by Muslims who were Arabs and Berbers from North Africa. And... These sites have both been studied extensively in terms of these elite residences. But I was actually looking for the, um, you guessed it, the pyrotechnology, um, (laughs) where people were doing stuff with fire. Uh, So we wanted to investigate that aspect of it, you know, the actual construction of them, the workshops. And so we were digging at the Alhambra and we were digging with approximately 30,000 tourists a day going past us. So that was extreme. And in Madinat al Zahra, we were doing a large scale survey to get the building plans of the site um, so that we could actually look at the city layout and try to work out where all the things were located, like workshops, residences, yeah. mosques, all of that. Oh, brilliant. Um, how important to your studies has um, experimental archaeology been? Well, that's something that I'm increasingly um, doing and increasingly my research group at Newcastle are doing it. So I've always sort of I've always been a sort of end user of the results of experimental archaeology um and dabbled around a bit you know with with making things with making little kilns and furnaces but um I came to realize that a lot of what you read especially so I'm I'm mainly looking at glass I look at the others but I'm looking at glass as well um and a lot of what you read about glass is based on um what I'd call sort of orthodoxies that have come from those few brave souls who've gone out there and done the experimental work so they said right we're going to reconstruct we're not going to do this in the lab. We're going to reconstruct an actual wood-fired furnace outside. We're going to look at what effects that has on how you can make the glass. And um, so one of the earliest ones like this was Caroline Jackson, who's at Sheffield, who reconstructed what is probably the earliest known glass furnace hmm. at Amarna. And she did that in order to demonstrate, that's in Egypt, she did that in order to demonstrate that it was possible to make glass in the furnace. Right. So people were questioning whether it was a glass furnace. And what she showed was that, yes, a furnace like that could be used to make glass. It doesn't prove that it was, no. but it showed that it could have been. And so this kind of work was really, really important, but there were actually quite only a small number of people doing it. Hmm. And the problem with that is there are so many ways of doing things technologically. And as soon as you've only got a small group of people doing it, you kind of develop these orthodoxies. It's really important that there are lots of people out there doing experimental work and always testing 
whether there are other ways things could be done or other explanations we could find for things. Hmm. And that's when I really became interested in it. Fascinating. Um, have you actually had a chance to do some of your set up experiments yourself? What kind of work have you been doing? Yeah, I well, I started um, I started with a postdoctoral research fellowship uh, looking at glass, glass recycling. And the idea with that was I would manufacture... This is the one with the British Academy? That's right, yeah, British Academy. Um, and it was yeah. all about looking for evidence of recycling because if you're recycling glass, it's a little bit invisible in the archaeological record because it's being recycled. So you don't, you don't kind of see recycling practice. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can see evidence for it in the chemistry of the glass. So this was already known, but what my project was doing was kind of trying to use all the data that's out there already and then also use glasses that I'd made myself in the lab to match the original glasses and recycled over and over again. Um, and so I got so far with that, got a lectureship, um, didn't quite finish the experimental side. So it's still all sitting there in my office and someday it will get finished. But I have luckily now got um, some really great PhD students. And one of those, Victoria Lucas, is doing work yeah. around recycling. And she's actually built an outdoor furnace. She lived there with the furnace for two weeks, sleeping overnight. We all did a shift um, sleeping overnight to keep it at wow. temperature. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's, you have to, you have to really be into it, experimental archaeology to do it. It's really intense. Yeah. How has being a lecturer impacted on your own research? Um, well, <laughs> it's, um, it has made it a lot harder to do my own research and, that's fairly normal. Um, you know, obviously I have a lot of teaching duties. I have administrative responsibilities, but I'm also supervising other people's work and other people's projects. So I think I probably get my kicks these mm. days mostly out of what students are doing. So research students are doing with me or um, postdoctoral fellows um, and their research. So we, we're working together and I'm kind of directing yeah. it, but I don't, sadly, don't get to do so much of the day to day looking down the microscope sort of work that I used to do in my early career. Yeah. Did you think it's where you were going to end up with your career in archaeology? I think from quite early on, I wanted to be a lecturer, but I think I probably wanted it for very different reasons than I want now. I think I had in my head like a sort of picture of a Tweedy, a Tweedy person um, who was very knowledgeable <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and innately self-confident. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm still just me, um, but uh, uh, <laughs> but I have. <laughs> You've not I gone don't. through this chrysalis phase <laughs> and come out with tweed wings or anything. No, like that. if only wouldn't tweed wings be fab? <laughs> I'd love it. No, so it's it, yeah, you know it's very it's impractical, yeah. <laughs> awful for wet weather. Yeah, true. You need a special. And uh, anyway, I won't go into that. <laughs> I'm getting sidetracked. By the, by the <laughs> Let's talk about the material qualities of wings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so no, it's different. Being a le being a lecturer is um, it's amazing. I love working with the students. I love designing new courses. That's so much fun. Um, but it, it really does suck your time, and so and so you have to. I think anyone going into it thinking it's just you know sitting in a library all the time, um, they would be in for a, a quite a shock. I think. Well, you, you've managed to also take on quite a lot of other responsibilities, it would appear, um, apart from lecturing. You're also on the editorial board of World Archaeology, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's quite recent. Oh, it's fabulous. What a nice bunch of people. Um, yeah, it's yeah. great. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> so what, do, what, what does that actually entail? What do you, how, like, how much time does it take and what kind of um, activities? So we have two in-person meetings per year. Um, and that's when all the board members get together, editorial board members get together. And then the rest of it is essentially what we do is we divide up because World Archaeology has thematic issues. So each issue, there's a call for a particular theme and then the papers come in at the deadline and, and we choose from those that have come in. Um, so my one is technology and power, which the deadline is this June. And so what we do, the editors, mainly is that we work on our own thematic issues, either by ourselves or with somebody else coming in to work with us. Um, and then obviously we're there to, to assist with what other people are doing. So if, if you know, if, if somebody else needs things reading and that kind of stuff and looking at the general direction of the of the journal itself, you know, where we want to go. We're trying to make sure that, you know, we, we are representative, that we are world archaeology and that we get enough archaeology from other parts of the world. It's not just European, that kind of thing. So, so we, we generally steer it, but really we're working on as well, working on editing, editing each volume as it comes out. How did you get involved with it in the first place? Um, I was invited 
onto the board um, and I'm not sure. Maybe I thought maybe they've got the wrong person. Um, <laughs> is, there another, is there another Chloe Duckworth? No, it was me. Um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure how that happened, um, but I think they were looking for someone who did material science um, and my name must have come up um, and they offered me it and I was, yeah, I was totally happy to do that. People do know your name uh, and one of the ways that people do know your name is that you... Uh, I'm gonna. It seems off your own bat started a YouTube channel. Yes, the yeah. Ar- uh, Archeo Duck. Um, which, what was it that prompted you to start doing that in the first place? It's. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I I remember when I got my British Academy Fellowship that I said I was going to do some outreach and I was going to make videos. But they were initially going to be about glass. Um, and then I thought, who's going to, like, how am I going to make that work? And I was looking at what videos and podcasts there were out there. And I thought, do you know what? It'd be really nice just to do one that, you know, there, there are lots of great archaeology content out there. But, but to do one that's a little bit punk, a little bit fresh and very brief, that's just kind of five minute explanations of key themes in archaeology, that kind of thing. And I also, as part of that fellowship I had, I was lucky enough to go to a training day and in, it was about media. And in the training day, um, this woman from the BBC gave me some really hot tips and she said, oh, Chloe, you know, you should, you should try it. You should just do it on YouTube. And I was like, okay, I will. So I didn't know how it was going to go. I was so embarrassed um, to be doing it. <laughs> I felt like so silly and I had to ask my friends to look at it for me. And I was sitting there, you know, the first time you're sitting yeah. there and talking to a camera and you're all on your own anyway. And it's, you're actually talking to loads of people, but you can't see them. And mm-hmm. yeah, it was, I, I think I recorded the first video about 18 different times until I was like, okay, now I, now I can do this. Yeah. So. <laughs> what was the first one about? What was the first one about and why did you decide to go with that one? It was, well, I called it, so what, the reason I went for it is I went and Googled um, archaeology and looked what people were asking about. And I just went, what is archaeology? Mm. Um, and so once you got past the ancient aliens. Um... <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, they creep into some of mine as well. I'm not, uh, yeah, I have a little rant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so I, I basically, um, I just wanted to... Actually, I think, you know, I actually just wanted to say archaeology is not just digging. I think always that this fabulously successful time team that was on UK TV for so long um, has perhaps given a certain image of archaeology and archaeologists. And it's an, I think it's an absolutely true image because those people are real, but there are a whole lot of other people who might not look like that. And I kind of wanted to make it accessible to them and to say, you don't have to be this kind of pipe swilling you know beardy person um to do archaeology Mm. and you don't have to be a field archaeologist sure you have to know how to dig but you know there are other things and I just kind of wanted to get that message out there because I think at the time I didn't think that message was really clear Mm. so the first video that you did was just a general one about answering those questions on the internet what makes you do the second video I'm trying to remember what my second video was now. <laughs> um, well, exactly. The first video yeah. is easy. The first video is answering questions that people want. The second video is the one that you've you've decided to yeah, do that one. Yeah, well, I think then I, I actually I did ask people for some feedback. And then the next few that I did, there was one that was um, claiming to tell you your archaeological superpower, um, which was essentially... <laughs> I've seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it might make people think that it's more exciting than it is because it's essentially typology, but... Um, what I was telling people is that, you know, we all have the ability to classify things. Um, you know, we, we kind of have this intuition and that actually that's really important in archaeology, um, classifying things perhaps over time or, you know, how they vary. Um, and mm. yes, I did, a I did another one about, um, looking at, what was that looking at? I remember Tutankhamun's dagger, but I can't remember actually what I was... <laughs> what I was getting at in the video <laughs> I was talking about metallurgy anyway because metallurgy is very cool um yeah, yeah. and then I you know I, I just the early ones um they seem very far back they're a bit of a jumble there was one where I I did uh excavating through using chocolate to show how stratigraphy builds up and then how you peel it away which actually I thought was a really important one because I'd been asked that question how do the layers build up in the ground over time and I'd been asked, I'd yeah. heard people saying some very strange stuff in the past. Um, 
And I thought, you know, we're never really explicitly told how things get in the ground. Um, obviously, we know how a grave gets there, it's dug, but why is other stuff yeah. buried? So I went into that uh, in that video and ate a lot of chocolate. Yeah, it's... <laughs> when you were choosing what you were going to talk about, what was the balance between the things that you thought were interesting and the things that you thought would get people watching them? Yeah, um, that's that's where Archaeoduck sits for me. Um, it's trying to find the the crux, the point between. Um, so in metallurgy, you'd call it you'd call it the eutectic. So it's the point where the lowest energy. Ooh, what's that word? <laughs> it's where you need the lowest energy to create to. Um, to create the alloy that you're, you're creating. So um, in this sense, the alloy is between, um, as you say, what people, what excites people and interests people and what I think it's important that people know about archaeology. And always, every time I make a video, I'm trying to find that meeting point. Um, probably with the exception mm. of my more recent ones, which have largely been about interviewing people. Um, because the interviews are really about me saying look archaeology is really diverse it's a really diverse in terms of what you can do as an archaeologist it's really diverse in terms of who does it and i know that you know that because that's what you do um yeah <laughs> but yeah I mean, the interviews aside i think i'm often trying to just find something important but tell it in a way that's interesting your most viewed video is about trying to explain uh c14 yeah. carbon 14 dating Okay. I've got a couple of questions about that. First of all, what was the feedback like on that video? Um, I've seen some comments, and I've got to say, uh, of, of, of having looked through the comments, I, I really have uh, huge, uh, incredible compliments for the way that you dealt with some <laughs> of them. I, I think they were fantastic. Um, it was, it was really you. good to see you were sort of in, dealt with, and if they have a follow-up that's nonsense, never hear from me again. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, but this is it. This is what I found interesting is um, it was well, the only video I saw where the comments you had some, um, for want of a better term, conspiracy theory-based uh, responses. And I just wondered whether that was something you were expecting how you dealt with it and, and what that uh, meant for how you thought about uh, the idea of C14 data. Well, yeah, I, it is interesting. It's it's a very triggering um, topic. And it's, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to do them down too much because it's largely thanks to them, but it's got so many views. Uh, <laughs> but, but there, are, there are people who will go trawling the internet for these kind of trigger points, things that they want to disagree with, and then they will, you know, they'll, they'll look them up and they will... Um, go on there to comments. That's what they're doing. Um, but Mark Bartman Assels, who, who does Archeo Soup, um, the, the other, that, that YouTube channel, um, the other, I was going to say the other archaeology YouTube channel, but there are loads of them. There's not just two, <laughs> um, but, um, another channel. Um, he, he was saying, you know, cause he's been doing it for much longer than me. And he was saying that, you know, for him, part of one of the main motivators of doing this is, is to deal with pseudo archaeology. And I think, Perhaps it's not so much pseudo-archaeology, it's not quite ancient aliens, it's people kind of denying that absolute dating works, usually on religious grounds. Um, it was interesting to me that there are a number of religious people who, who actually liked it, because of course you don't have to disagree with um, with this to be religious. Um, but those those who didn't, uh, yeah, the arguments they made were very difficult to to counter, because it was often hard to find what the point was that they were actually making. And there's only so much you can do, but I think at least it's out there and at least it's, it's talking about the scientific method. So, so one of the things that I get is people say, well, it's all assumptions. You know, you, you're saying in the video that scientists are making assumptions. So therefore you're just guessing. And I'm saying, no, scientists are testing their assumptions. We all make assumptions. You know, when I walk out of the front door in the morning, I assume that it's not going to be 500 degrees centigrade and blast me <laughs> to, to cinders. Um, that's an assumption I'm making. Um, we live by assumption. The day you get that wrong. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you know, this is this is this is what people don't understand. Um, and I think just talking calmly about why I trust the scientific method in general, I think is is fine. And also being able to criticize it as well and say, you know, of course there are ways in which science could do better and ways in which scientists and scientific funding are not always great. Mm. When you are putting these videos out, what are you hoping that is the end like the ideal end result for the audience that are consuming them? 
Oh, that, I love that question. Um, I, I'm hoping that, I'm hoping a lot of things, and it depends on the audience, but I'm hoping that people, sort of, people who might know a little bit about archaeology can learn a bit more. I'm hoping that people can realise archaeology is more interesting and diverse than perhaps they at first knew, like a bit like me when I was sort of 17 choosing my university place. And again, you know, going back to the diversity, going back to who practices it, I just want to show show it to be the wide field that it is. And I think there's, there's another thing here, which I don't think my videos could do, but which I just want people to get, which is that um, it's it's incredibly good for things like transferable skills. So if you've got a past, if you've got a, a career in archaeology behind you, there are loads of things you can do that people who've done some another job might not be able to do. And I'm just going from, you know, everything from teamwork um, to to just being able to go from maths to drawing stuff to, um, you know, th there's just this mm. whole range of skills and, and everyone's sort of cherry picking a, a set, subset of those skills. But the archaeologist has to be multi-skilled and they have to be able to problem solve. So I kind of just want to say to people, look, archaeology is amazing, and, and you should know that because you haven't always been told the full picture of it. If um, we collectively own the cultural past, what is the purpose of a professional archaeologist? Um, so I think it's really, really important that people do have access to archaeology and pe you know, members of the public um, through things like community projects. But we also need we need specialists because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it is a specialist profession. Just going back to excavation itself, um, anybody who is a skilled excavator, you, you simply cannot replace that with anything else. There's no machine. There's no, you know, book to this. It, it is a skill, like akin to being a surgeon. You, you need a skill, a skilled person to understand this. Um, but I do think that there's been way too much gatekeeping in the past. And that's one of the other reasons I wanted to put the videos out there, because I think if people actually have the tools, they actually understand the tools we use in our trade, then they won't need to be drawn to things like conspiracy theories about aliens and all of that, because that's really born from people wanting to intellectually engage with the subject and feeling excluded from it. And I think that's a real shame. Um, and that shame lies with us. We need to do better on that. But we, mm. we totally need the professionals alongside that. Um, to make sure that things are done to professional standards. Yeah. So that brings us, I think, quite neatly to the Great British Dig. Ah. Uh, <laughs> if we're talking about community work, um, which is, uh, it, it's out on Mar 4 at the moment, isn't it? It's it's yeah. just starting or it's just been, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, so we've had the pilot, the pilot aired on th last Thursday, whatever the date was then. Um, hmm. I think it was the 9th uh, on Mar 4, so it should be on Mar 4 for a while. And... You know, I mean, hopefully there might be a series coming out of that, which would be great if, yeah. if it does. Yeah. So this was something that I, I believe they approached you because they'd seen your work uh, through the videos. How did the process of getting involved with the Great British Dig actually take place? What What were the steps that suddenly got you onto more for? Well, um, the the well, you know, someone said this about warfare, so it's probably a bit trite to apply it to TV. But it's meant to be <laughs> long periods of nothing punctuated by short, sharp periods of terror. Um, and <laughs> and the, <laughs> what, what okay. happens is that people contact you and they're like, oh, we might be interested in doing something with you. And you say, OK, that, that sounds cool. And then you hear nothing, 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 nothing. And then suddenly they say, oh, we're filming next week. Do you want to come along? And you think, oh, my God, I can't do that. You know, um, and then you end up doing it because, like, it's because they told me that Hugh Dennis was going to be there, basically. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I really, you know, TV is TV's mm. a mad world. I've been approached quite a few times about things, and I was never right for whatever the thing was at the time or the thing didn't make it to screen. Um, so, you know, I was just thinking, oh, well, you know, I'll go and do this. It'll be fun because it is fun. Um, it's super fun mm. filming stuff. Um, but yeah, this this one seems to have seems to have worked, and it's come yeah. out. Um, does a does a successful archaeological uh, TV program need a sitcom acting comedian to front it? <laughs> Do you know what I think it does? Because you need, you know, this is what Tony um, Robinson was. You you need an everyman who can 
who can intermediate between between the archaeologists. I mean, we are boring sometimes. Come on, when we get together and it's just yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you need oh, someone not... who can cut through that and say, no, guys, yeah. seriously, um, you know. D- d- what, what's actually going on here? What's actually interesting here? Um, and I think one of the reviews of the show said he played the combined role of taxi driver and dad, which <laughs> <laughs> which I think was pretty much summed it up. Yeah, I've had, had the advantage of never being good enough archaeologist to be fully boring. <laughs> I, I think that makes you a good archaeologist. <laughs> oh, no. Mind you, that said, you get me talking about bricks. Oh, <laughs> I like bricks, um, actually. Yeah, they're so good. <laughs> we'll do this. No, no, no. <laughs> We're both pulling, pulling faces at each other going, we, we mustn't. <laughs> we, we, we mustn't. We must. We mustn't. We must. There'll be a special in like two weeks' time. Yeah. Just bricks. <laughs> no listeners. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. I was all, I'm always astonished at the things that catch hold. Like, I, I obviously... I work. Um, I do a lot of Twitter, and, and yourself, you, you're quite active on Twitter as well. Um, and I'm surprised at what catches people's imagination. Like the most responded to thing I've had recently uh, was asking if anyone could identify um, what a small series of sockets on a bollard that I walked past was. And it's like I just like I saw that. Yeah, like, yeah. And I, yeah, it's like I flicked the lid on the the Ark of the Covenant. Just like. <laughs> <laughs> It's astonishing. Yeah. Uh, how powerful a tool or how useful a tool is is social media for you? That's been an interesting journey. I initially put up a page on Facebook um, and tried to use that. And I found that absolutely, to be honest, it's, it gets very little interaction because Facebook doesn't promote anything. and You basically have to pay them. Um, and I, I don't really want to pay. Um, but then when I joined Twitter, uh I, that's an interesting one because you sort of find yourself in a bit of an echo chamber. I know that's a bit of a cliche now, but mm. you know, you do end up, there are, there are circles of people and we're all following each other. And I really like that aspect of it because there's a, di- there's a digital community out there. And especially at the moment when we're in the middle of a viral lockdown, it's quite nice to have um, various different communities out there. But I think in terms of how useful it is, I don't know. I think talking to individual, I, I approached some individual people and said, hi, would you mind watching this video that I've done? Um, people like David Connolly from Badger, um, mm. British Archaeological Jobs and Resources. And he actually then put up that first video on Facebook. And I think within a day on his Facebook platform and within a day it had doubled the number of viewers. So yeah. I think people are more likely to go for something if there is an individual that they trust promoting right. it. Yeah. But then you build a brand, don't you? And, and you sort of, you know, I mean, I say a brand, it's, it's horrible. And I haven't done any videos for six months because I've been just absolutely life. Um, but, you know, yeah. you, if people kind of see it and they think, well, I know that they're not usually full of rubbish, then they might be more inclined to watch it in future. Yeah. So. The, the Great British Dig, this yeah. way of like looking into um, back gardens and sort of like um, essentially this is an awful term, but like micro excavations, uh, t- tiny little windows into the archaeological record. Is this something that um, we could use to promote archaeology in this time that we like, as we're recording, we are in sort of the, the social isolation and things like that. Is this something that people could use um, as something they can do at home? Well, that's, I think it's great that it was getting people interested. And, you know, we know that a lot of old houses, especially if they're, you know, Victorian, they've got Victorian rubbish dumps somewhere in the garden anyway, buried under there. Um, so people who are just digging anyway to dig up the flower beds or whatever are going to be coming across finds. You always come across something, you know, mm. Lego brick or something. I think there would, it, I think it's great to promote that. I don't want people to do anything dangerous or illegal so you know you have to check what what kind of am i living in in listed ground you know is have i just found some kind of important wall i should definitely tell the county archaeologist uh, am i digging yeah. a two a one by one meter pit that goes two meters down don't do that that will kill you yeah. um so i i think it's <laughs> i think it's great that people go out and explore and i think it's mm. really really good to open that conversation but i'd always also advocate a little bit of caution and, and always kind of seek advice if if you do think yeah. you've found something um that's genuinely was, archaeological 
Was there any like discussion of that when you were putting the program together of like we might be about to start like just an army of diggers? Well, you know, I think it's it's something that makes me rather nervous, uh, and I think it is. Uh, that's probably why I'm just going to keep, keep repeating this point. You know, by all means, explore. That's fantastic, but just be careful what you're doing. Don't take it too far. Um, mm. And you know, I mean, there might be pets <laughs> there are and things, things called gas men. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you've got you know you've got to be really careful, and if it's the amount of digging that you'd normally be doing in your garden fine mm. um but it's you know there's no reason you can't do that with a you know with a more structured approach um but yeah exactly the safety aspect and the sort of legal aspects i think you need yeah. to be quite careful with those all right so your media career pff, takes off right <laughs> great british dig taken for a series is you know well deserved we need a program like that We're talking to people about community archaeology it hasn't been something really of that ilk since time team, so I'm all for it. But someone comes at you with a budget and says, we're going to do a documentary mm. series on anything you want to talk about. What are you spending the money on? What are you te- oh. What are you telling the British people about? Oh, that sounds fantastic. Wouldn't that be great? Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I... Do you know what I would? I would love to do something. Um, going back to experimental archaeology, I'd love to do mm. something about craft, um, the history of craft, and something that could be almost an ethnographic film. So something that we could use as a source of evidence. Um, and we, you know, I mean, there have been some fantastic things lately where they went into a glassblower's workshop or a potter's workshop, and they filmed. It's this slow TV revolution. They filmed things, yeah. and they filmed the sounds so beautifully. And that the sensory aspects of having that sound coming in along with the visuals of somebody making something with their hands, I just thought was brilliant. And something along those lines, but that was looking at historical craft, I think would be amazing and would be really interesting to people as well. Yeah. Is there um, a loss of that immersion in the senses that are like smell, sound, taste, that are are lost from archaeology? Can you actually bring those back into it? Well, sensory archaeology has become quite a big deal lately. Um, you can, but you, you know, you, you just have to be so cautious. Um, I think we, if we don't, if we don't try to bring the senses in it, we're not, we're not, we're not creating less, um, we're not creating less uncertainty. We're just ignoring something that's, that exists. So, you know, I mean, if you, you walk into a Byzantine um, chapel, um, it is a sensory overload. It's deliberately made to be a sensory overload. If you don't acknowledge that in your writing, you're omitting the whole purpose of the thing. Um, if you're working in a in a noisy, noisy, crowded workshop, that is that is a very, very embodied and sensory experience. That if you just try to describe that by outlining, drawing where the furnaces in the workshop are, um, again, you're largely missing the point. So I think we do need to try and attack the sensory. It's just yeah. really hard to get to. But people do great jobs of doing that at the moment. I've only got a couple more questions left. Um, and thank you again for, for give us, just your time's been brilliant. Um, number one, when you say that you're interested in sort of pyrotechnology, what are the initial questions of people who aren't, who don't know what that subject mm. is? Um, usually why? <laughs> uh i'm not sure i i think people i've seen people sort of excuse the pun but glaze over um <laughs> when boo <laughs> but also yay somehow it's a pun, come on no don't get me started on glass puns that's, that's terrible um yeah it's a real pain oh nice one <laughs> yeah i i don't know what people ask me um they're usually I think I think when when I can sort of get it across to people why I'm interested in it is when I say, look, if you go to the Alhambra and you walk around the palace, you see all those glazed tiles and they're beautiful, stunning glazed tiles everywhere. Well, somebody was making them en masse in this area over here that's now hidden under a garden. And I think people kind of go, oh, and they sort of think, well, the experience of being here in sort of 1400 is actually very different to the experience of being here now because it was full of noisy furnaces and kilns in this in this area and people building the the actual palaces that we're visiting. So I think normally people do tend to ask like, what, why? What does it tell you? Um, and the, the answer is, well, you know, it tells us how and why people made things in the past, which I personally think is really important. Okay, we're into the last two questions. All right, number one, 
Sight cat or sight dog? Oh, sight dog. <laughs> <laughs> Any particular reason why? Because the, is it because there's one sat on your lap he's, right now? He's and you're looking like, at yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be judged. Exactly. He'll be, he'll be sassy at me all night. <laughs> Actually, that's uh, more of a cat behaviour, isn't it? So I, I'm probably oh, safe. Yeah. <laughs> the dog's like, fine, pick a cat. I still love yeah. you. Um, and the last question. You work in the heritage industry, but how would you like to be remembered? Ah, uh, I would like to be remembered as someone who helped her students and helped people who worked with her and, you know, helped people to get into archaeology. That would be, if I could be remembered as that, that would be fantastic. Brilliant. That's a really lovely one. <laughs> um, is there anything you'd like to plug at the end? No. Oh, I'm, I'm very good. Go watch my YouTube channel. Otherwise, uh, yeah. Or maybe The Great Big Dig. Great British Dig, sorry. It was called The, <laughs> it was called the Great Big Dig uh, when we were filming it and they changed the name. So <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> ah, right. Trying to get in on that Mary Benny, Berry money. <laughs> Chloe, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. The music you were listening to was by From the Ashes. Check them out on Bandcamp. It was produced by me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. You can follow me on Twitter at AskAnarch or you can send an email at AskAnarch at gmail.com. But most importantly, if you've enjoyed yourself and you think you have a friend who might be interested in the podcast, please tell them about it. Write a review, put up a star rating, let people know that we're here. It's incredibly helpful and much appreciated. Once again, thank you to everyone who has asked an art. Bye-bye.